that. <laughs> That's right. I was watching a war movie yesterday with my father-in-law, Rick Bunchy. And there was a drill saw. <laughs> what? The Pacific? The, the, the show, yeah, the series. OK, so yeah, Nick's seen it, right? The boys are all in boot camp, right? And they're sitting there sleeping in their beds. It's 3 in the morning. The crickets are cricketing outside. Everything is calm and peaceful. And a guy comes into the barracks, and he just starts ringing the bell. Boo! Get up on your feet, Marines. Let's go. And one of the guys is like, oh, yeah, you know, this is like lame. We're just in boot camp right now. This doesn't really matter. I just can't wait to slap a jap. And he's like, what? You calling the enemy names? Just a caricature? The Japanese soldier has been fighting for years. And all these guys are like 18, 19 years old. So anyway, we're going to read the Bible right now. Marching orders. Yeah, that's right. Sam, where, where are we at here? We did outside help. We did not finish chapter 10. Okay, last time we talked about Jesus with the sword. Yeah. Okay. Going to make me get out of my chapter 10 presentation and go all the way back to 5 and go all the way to the end and show you Nalu. This is one of my first pictures of Nalu. I'll tell you the story. I'll tell you the story behind this picture. He is a tiny little noise. Okay, so when I took this photo, I think it was uh, the spring of 2017, and I was making a video. Remember that conference video I showed you guys in my very first teaching, like the missionaries? So I would sit on my chair, and Nalu would sit with me while I edit. And I just feel like I have to succeed in life or else this dog will starve. <laughs> that's, that's how I felt. I bet you some of you guys are going to feel that way sometimes. Like, I want to stop working right now, but if I don't, I won't be able to pay the mortgage. Okay. But Jesus blesses you in those moments. <laughs> Got really dark and sad. <laughs> But yeah, Nalu is super cute, right? So you're like, shoot, this, this is beautiful, this little dog. All right. Um, do you guys remember this talk that we did? Yeah. Air support, gets out, get outside help. Israelis take over their jurisdictions. The Israelis, the Israelis, by telling the truth in their uh, boot camp, they... Uh, they were able to get air superiority and win the Six-Day War and take a lot of uh, ground. These are the areas of outside help that you should use. The Bible, have a pastor and a church that you're a part of. This is serious stuff. Have older mentors, honor your parents, Christian friends, even your parents. If you struggle in your relationship with your parents, find a way to honor them. Find a way. Think about the thing that they do well and honor them for that or honor them for providing for you. Find some reason that put your brain in the honoring posture. Uh, Christian friends. Are you guys going to stay friends? Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> Are you serious? Well, there's a lot of distance, so we're still friends, but we probably won't hang out together too often. You guys going to make a, a Facebook group where you can pray for each other or something? <laughs> I don't use Facebook. I, yeah. I just wanted to, I would thought that was the current thing. Group me. Okay, group me. You guys going to get on MySpace? And uh, uh, 
you guys are probably going to have bosses after this. You guys ready for that? Ready to have a boss? I'm telling you what right here. Troy Adamitis. That guy right there. He's one of my outside helps. Troy Adamitis. He taught me how to make videos. He taught me how to shoot. Taught me how to edit. Whoa. Hey, boys. What are you talking about? It's the so last name. name. It's so stupid. Yeah. Adam Adamitis. That sounds like a oh, yeah. soldier. Yeah, he is. Oh, that's sick. Low joke, that's he is. I think he's, yeah. It's the Croatian names, okay, Croatia. Uh, yeah, it's too bad Troy couldn't make it out here for Anchor House, but uh, what's happening right here is I have just worked for like 12 hours on something, and then I gotta sit down and Troy watches it, and while he watches it, I realize, shoot, I was lazy on that part. I was lazy on that part. But this dude right here always found a way to, well, not always, like we grew together a lot. But by the end of our working together, he would always start his criticisms of the stuff I did with, I think this is some of your best work. But I think this part, this part. And I, he always found a way to kind of build me up a little bit before. So we worked together for 10, 12 years. And I, if, if you... If you look at your boss as a source of help and not a problem, because you're going to think your boss is a problem, but if you look at them as a source of help, then uh, they will be a blessing. The reason why I put blank for number seven is because what is number seven? Jesus. Jesus. Come on. He's really outside of me. He's really inside. So. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not your own strength. It's not your own power. I put Jesus because that's the most important one. Okay? He's, he better be your outside help. Okay. We're getting into some serious stuff here towards the chapter 10 and 11 of the book of Joshua. This is how Joshua 10 ends, and chapter 11 has a lot of similar sort of stuff in it. So we're going to get into it here. Okay. Who wants to read uh, verses... 28, and these are summaries of 29 through 39, because I want you to see a common theme here. Uh, who wants to read for us? All right, Sam. That day, Joshua took uh, that guy. He put the city. That's, that's, I think that's a place. Is it? Makeda. Oh, you might be right. Yeah, it is. You're right. Makeda. Uh, that day, Joshua took Makeda. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors, and he did to the king of Makeda as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel okay. with him and moved on from Makeda. Okay, okay. I just want to paraphrase the next uh, 10 verses. So he moved on from Makeda, and he went to Libna, and he left no survivors there. Is that what it says in your Bible? Then he went to Lachish. He left no survivors there. He went to Eglon, put it to the sword, and totally destroyed everyone in it. Hebron. They left no survivors. Debir. They left no survivors. Who can read uh, 40 through 42? Maddie. Go for it. All right, so God is fighting for Israel. Okay, here's my question. What do you guys make of these phrases? It's like over and over, right? This is like the repeated phrase. They left no survivors. They utterly destroyed everything that breathed. What do you guys... Right. Yep. So, Blake. Sorry, I, it doesn't really apply to this, or 
Mm-hmm. be the same God that is telling them to leave male survivors and kill everyone. Yeah. So this is what today's discussion is about. So I think that question we're, I'm going to try to answer in the totality of the whole class and not give you one answer. Does that make sense? Because um, that um, question was the reason why, or one of the big questions I had, and the reason, one of the reasons why I wanted to teach the book of Joshua, because of this struggle, right? This is like a difficult thing. Uh, what were you going to say, Trent? Um, some kind of foreshadowing for kind of like the end times or everyone against God. Like, yeah. Yeah, I think we'll get into that as well. Well, one of the... Th- Two things I wanted to point out at the beginning. Um, Contextual limitations. What this means is that some of the regions that we're saying were completely destroyed and there's no survivors. We're talking about like a specific area and not the entire, like a, a large area. Does that make sense? So the reason why I'm saying this is because in Judges, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles. You're gonna hear like the Ammonites or the uh, Am Am. I said Ammonites. There's another one. What? Amorites. I think the Amorites did get totally destroyed, but the Ammonites, the Perizzites, or the Philistines, the, all these groups of people are still fighting Israel. They're still there, and you're like, okay, if he destroyed all of them, how are they still there fighting, right? So one of the things you have to think about is that these sometimes are talking about, like in the previous verse, this is a city, Libna, this is a city, Eglon, Hebron. These are areas, but there's most likely inhabitants of these areas that fled during the time of war and then came back and repopulated. And so it wasn't technically everybody. Um, Another uh, explanation is, Hyperbole. Do you guys know what hyperbole is? Um, So can someone look up Acts 2.5 and Colossians 1.23? Okay, you got Acts. You want to do Colossians, Seth? All right, everybody. We're all going there. We're all going there together because we're a team. Got it, Kate? Two five. Two five. Two five. Now the word saying in Jerusalem, God be you from every nation under heaven. What does that mean? <laughs> there were Jews that were Do you guys think it was literally Do you think it was literally every nation under heaven? Why not? Because Why? I don't think there were North American, Native American Jews. I, because this is probably hyperbole. This is probably saying like everywhere that. Was there people there yet? Like you can't have a nation come from that area. Yeah, but I'm saying commentators think that this is hyperbole. Commentators think that there, he's not literally saying that every single nation under the face of the earth, there were Jews from there. But, you know, he's, ba- he's basically Jesus. saying everywhere that we know of or, yeah. When it was created? What do you mean by fancy stuff? Well, hyperbole is, is like a fancy word for just saying, like, I just go surf there all the time, right? Uh, I need an example. I think a lot of it's like before something is given a name, it still exists. Yeah. Like even though it's not like they aren't necessarily going to call it like Iron Man, there still is Iron Man survival. You know, because like that's how people talk and spoke. And well, I mean, we like to think of ourselves as way smarter and more advanced and all this stuff. And in a lot of ways, we obviously are. But in some Mm. of the Mm. history there's 
the most advanced literature that we've ever discovered, and it's still like some of the oldest. So we look back and compare it to like Shakespeare or stuff that we can barely understand today, and it it like rivals that in many ways. So as far as like advanced literature style, it's way more advanced than anything we have. Yeah. Uh, does does that help, Trent? Yeah. Um, who's got Colossians one twenty three? If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. So here we are. Has the gospel been preached to every creature at this point? What? Wait, in Colossians. In Colossians. He says, this gospel, which was preached to every creature under heaven. Not at that point, right? But he's talking about either the fact that it will be preached, and it's like a sure thing that it will be done, or he's saying, like, we've been preaching everywhere. We've been preaching to the whole world, right? There's people preaching to the whole world. It's a, it's a hyperbolic statement. So I'm not saying that uh, you have to accept this as your understanding of this text, but this is what a lot of commentators, this is what, uh, actually Dane was the first person to tell me this, um, that this is a possibility for these texts. Um, do you guys, let's go, can someone grab um, Joshua 13, 2 through 5? Uh, why don't you, you go, Keely, and, and Seth, why don't you take Joshua 17? And then um, who can do Judges 1, 27? Um, and then who can do Judges 2, 1 through 4? Maddie? Sorry, Zach. Oh, you can you, uh, well, I'm not going to have you read all those books. <laughs> uh, all right, who's got Joshua 13? Okay, so what, what this text is saying is basically you're going to hear took all the land, destroyed everyone, but then Joshua is going to come back and say these are areas that they did not conquer, okay? So just I'm putting this under the hyperbole part because the Bible is going to say it, you know, they t destroyed everything. Sometimes it's talking about a, a contextual limitation. Sometimes it might be a hyperbole, um, Someone got Joshua 17. The descendants of Manasseh could not possess these cities because the Canaanites were determined to stay in the land. However, when the Israelites grew stronger, they imposed forced labor on the Canaanites but did not drive them out completely. Okay, so this is talking about like a specific area, right? Some regions were not totally taken. And uh, this is actually contrary to what God wanted, right? God wanted them to take the land, but they didn't. They made them slaves instead, and it's going to be a problem for them in the future. Basically, they're, they're accommodating these people. We don't want to drive them out. We don't want to fully uh, obey what God is saying. They make accommodations um, by making them slaves. Um, let's just, for Judges 1, let's just read two or three verses on that one. Is that you, Brett? No, oh, it's Trisha, sorry. Mm-hmm.
okay? So th from 27 to verse 37 or 36 in the book of Judges, there's basically a list of all these Canaanite groups and lands that the Israelites failed to drive out. They didn't, they were not able to do it or they chose not to, to do it, okay? And so um, this is why you're going to see in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, that these peoples are going to be a snare and a problem for the Israelites for the rest of their history in Canaan. Um, Judges two one through four. <coughs> Who's got that one? Okay, so what do you guys take from that text right there? So that's an important one, right? We've talked about in Joshua the ones that weren't driven out, and in Judges it comes up again. And then this text in Judges, an angel of the Lord appears and basically tries to sum it all up. What's he saying? Is he breaking his covenant with them? Uh, looks like it. So Blake asked a very good question. How is this the gospel? How is what we're talking about right now the good news of Jesus Christ, that we are saved by faith? Yeah. So this is a picture in like real, like it's a, it's a movie being played out, right, of the scene. I'm trying to sum up what you're saying. You tell me if I'm right, Trent. It's a scene being played out in real human blood, flesh, and swords and knives of what is a spiritual reality in our lives today, right? So let's take that a little bit further. How is it a spiritual reality in our lives today? When we disobey God on purpose, like his, like he doesn't bless us for that and he sometimes lets us feel the consequences of that. Yeah, like he's always willing to help us if we go to him for things. What if I ask the question this way? Are there any promises that you know God makes to you as a Christian that you have not possessed? What do you mean by possessed? Like, uh, for me... A promise of God is that merit, uh, children are a blessing from the Lord, right? Children are a blessing from the Lord. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. God desires godly offspring. These are all scriptures I'm quoting. These are promises about marriage and uh, being married. 
that the gospel, I believe, speaks to me as a married man that I have not possessed at this point in my life, right? But by faith, I can believe that, yes, you know, assuming that God wants us to have children and we're both physically able to, uh, that's something that I should pursue. Does that make sense? Like, I should drive out the doubt and the fear that, or drive out the, the selfishness that would make me think that if Allegra and I had no kids, I'd be better off surfing and uh, spending my free time, you know, doing things that I enjoy more than that. When God says, you'll have more joy, Nate, if you possess this, you know, if you possess this promise, then your life will be blessed. This is good news for you. To, for you to step into this, another uh, promise, um, being a part of a church. You may walk out of the anchor house and look for a church and struggle to find a church. But you may say, the Bible says that I am a member of the body of Christ. I am going to possess this promise. I am going to be a part of a church. I am going to contribute to the body of Christ. I'm going to make it my mission to contribute. And even if the church is struggling in the city that I am in, I am going to go to God in prayer, fix my eyes on Jesus and say, Lord, this is your church. You have established it and the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. That's a promise. Christ said he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So do you, do you guys get what I'm saying in how you got to find a promise that you are going to possess? And if you allow the Canaanites to dwell in the land, it's going to be a thorn and a snare. If you say... I cannot possess this promise of being a member of the church. I cannot possess that promise. I cannot possess the promise that, that I should be filled with the, what is that? Uh, assurance of my salvation. The spirit testifying with my spirit that I am a child of God. Lord, I, I don't feel right now that I am your child. I feel separated from you. Give me that assurance, as it says in Romans, that I am your child. Testify within me and let me know that I am your son, so that I may have confidence and be fearless. So by possess, you mean take it hard? I mean, make it real for your life. Like, this is, this is my life. This is what I'm going to live out. I'm going to live out these promises in Scripture, and I'm going to take possession of them are going to be mine. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I am not going to come into the house of God and just be depressed when I walk out. I'm going to find a way to get some joy when I come to church. I'm going to find a way to enter with thanksgiving. I'm going to find something to be thankful for. I'm going to give God praise for something. Okay. So, why does scripture use the phrase, everything that breathes? This right here, these scriptures, uh, can someone look up Psalm 150, verse 6? Uh, Keely? Who can grab Isaiah 2, 22? Colby? Isaiah 42, 5. Genesis 2-7. Zach's got it. Uh, Genesis 7-22. All right. Seth just wants them all. He wants to possess the scripture. Hallelujah. All right. Who's got Psalm 150? How does this apply? 
Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do you guys ever sing that song? It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Right? What are we saying here? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hey, it's God's breath anyway. He gave it to us. All we do, all we're doing when we praise the Lord is giving back to him, as Colby said in our last class, what's already his. So if we don't give back to God the breath in praise, eventually the truth is that our breath will be not be giving praise because the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Isaiah 2.22. So that, that breath right there, uh, Psalm 150, verse 6, this is the same word in Joshua, uh, chapter 10, verse 40. Um, and I think that's the only time that this word is used, again, in the Bible. Uh, these words here are similar, the, a similar Hebrew word, but it's not the exact same. Okay, Isaiah 2.22. Stop regarding man. What was the next line? In the, through his nostrils is breath, or of what account is he? All right. What, who is man? We have breath. We're fragile, right? We're dependent. It's the same one. What's that? It's the same one. Yeah. In the song of Joshua, the Oh, Okay. Well, my, my uh, study tool said it was, it was slightly different. Um, Isaiah 42, 5. Let's all turn there. Got to run our sprints. 42, 5. 42, 5. Let's see it on the page. Who's got this one? All right? So there it is. God is the one who gives us breath. God is the one who gave us life. Therefore, let us use our breath to praise him. Genesis 2 7. Who's got Genesis 2 7? Zachary, the warrior. There it is. This is the, probably the first time the word is used in the Bible, and it, it's saying that we do not live until God breathes his breath into us. And we, what does it say? We are all sustained by the word of his power. So our breath today, we are right now dependent on him. Genesis 7.22 So this is the flood of Noah, right? In Noah's day, this was the first time that God brought judgment in this way. Okay, so we got the, the word breath there. And here's Blake's question from earlier. How can this be the same loving God of the New Testament? How can God, as revealed here in Scripture, be a God of love and wrath? Do you guys have any answers you want to give to that uh man we're already at 40 gotta be kidding me i think i think job's pretty good at it he says the lord has given the lord has taken away blessed be the name of the lord so he's the one who gives life he's the one who has created his 
life. Yeah. It even says somewhere in the beginning of the Bible that the Lord uh, like causes sickness, the Lord heals, the Lord this, the Lord that, and mm-hmm. then in there it says the Lord gives life and the Lord takes away life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it is the Lord who does the giving and taking of life. But I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is when Jesus came, he came and that woman who's caught in adultery, he doesn't condemn her, right? Even though, you know, it seems in some ways like God in the Old Testament might have been the one to come and, you know, bring condemnation, bring death, right? bring judgment. But Jesus says, I don't, I don't condemn you. How is that the same character? Uh, here's the first point I would like to make. Can someone pull up Proverbs 22:15? Keely, some Seth, why don't you get Proverbs 23, 13, and 14? Let's just do the Proverbs first. What? Oh, Blake wants it. Okay. Oh, Blake said it. Let's go, Blake. All right, uh, Keely. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from them. I don't know if I told you guys the story, I think, one morning, but whenever I would do something wrong and I was going to get a spank, my dad would, like, call me into a, his office or, like, my bedroom when there was nobody there. I mean, this was, like, sheer terror, right? When I was a little kid, my dad played professional football. His hands are huge, and he's strong, Okay. I remember one time I was running, and he was upset that I was, like, running in the house or something, and he literally just palmed my head like a basketball and pulled me back and, like, sat me down next to him. Like, just... (laughs) All right, so he's he's a strong guy. Uh, So when I got in trouble, he would spank us with these, like, little wooden blocks or, like, cooking wooden spoons. Yeah, some of you guys are like, I got the same kind of spanks. My dad would sit me down, and he say, he would say, uh, Nate, why are you getting a spank? And usually it was like, you know, my mom had told me to clean my room, and I didn't do it. Or my mom had asked me to do something, and I didn't do it. And he, so the first thing I had to do was, like, fully confess what I did wrong, or I'm going to get another spank for lying. Okay, so uh, usually I confessed more than what I was really in trouble with so that I wouldn't get too spanked. But um, my dad would say, Nate, was that foolish? And I would say, yeah. And then he would say, Nate, you are a good boy. Nate, you are a good boy. And whenever my dad did parenting classes, he would always tell parents, tell your kids that they're good kids. Tell your daughter you're a good girl. Tell your son you're a good boy. But you have foolishness. Okay. Lexi, let me finish the story. Uh Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from them. So what, is, what he was saying and what he taught in his, his parenting classes is that foolishness is a spirit. There's a spirit in all of us of sin. But discipline will drive it far from us. So as a loving father, my dad would give me a spank well, he would say, do you want me to get the foolishness out? And I would say, I don't know. Uh, eventually, I would say yes, right? And then he'd give me a spank. Um, it's a lot better to get a spank than to get grounded. It's over in like a second, right? You have a little bit of pain. It's humiliating a little bit. 
it was always the worst whenever my dad told me I had to get a spank and it was in front of like everybody in the whole house. It was really embarrassing. But if you get the foolishness out, then you can just go on with the rest of your day. It's over. Go play in the yard. Go do whatever. You got the foolishness out. So what I'm trying to say is that every time any, anyone, a loving father, anyone who loves something is going to get angry. Wrath means severe anger. That anytime somebody loves something and that thing is being threatened by something else, love gets in motion and starts moving to destroy the thing that is causing the object of love to be threatened. If I have a garden and I love that garden and weeds are going to destroy my plants, destroy my tomatoes, destroy my crops, I, if I really love that garden, if I don't care, I just let the weeds win. But if I really care, I go and I pull the weeds. I go and I clean it up. Someone... Uh, Let's do uh, Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. Don't withhold discipline from the youth. Punish him with a rod, he will not die. Punish him with a rod, and he will rescue his body from shale. If you punish your son with a rod, he will not die. If you punish him with a rod, you might save him from hell, is what it's saying. T teach, your, teach your children that sin brings death. That lying, if you lie and you live your life in deceit, if you, if you make a habit of lying, that's going to make your employer not trust you, your friends not trust you, your spouse not trust you. I want you to have a good relationship with your employer. I want you to have a good relationship with your friends. I want you to have a good relationship with your wife. Tell the truth even when it hurts. Right? That's what discipline is. It's, it's taking on some pain right now for the sake of killing the thing that's going to de really destroy me in the long term. The spirit of deceit. The spirit of pride. What, what, why did my dad say you are a good boy? Because we are made in the image of God. We have the imprint of God on us. Right? A lot of us I think all of us may have asked Jesus to live in our hearts, right? But there are spirits out there, lying, pride, self-righteousness. These things come and they want to destroy us, but we have to accept that God, because he loves us, and it is love that puts him into action to bring discipline and to bring correction. Does this make sense? You guys got this one? Hmm. Dang it. See, I'm really angry right now. Because class is over and I have like five more slides. Another day. Yes, Blake. I'm sorry. Can we do them at 830 or something? Sure, but then I'd have to do them again with the girls. Or should we have all the girls come? All right. Uh, I think we have to wait. I think we have to wait, Blake, because there's there's a bunch of them. But uh, I'm sorry. Mm. All right. Let's pray. Lord. We're so thankful that uh, you love us and you do discipline us and you do that because of your love. You do not want us to live lives full of thorns and thistles. You want us to live lives of freedom in you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to recognize the areas uh, that you are disciplining us and that you are treating us like your children and that is because of your love. I pray, Father, that... Uh, you would uh, give us willing hearts, Lord, to uh, accept your discipline, accept it as your love, and rejoice in it. 
and as much as we can in Jesus name. Amen. Mm. Yep.